Brecklin May. She was, I call her my baby cow. She was just the fattest little, well, not little, but she was just the fattest, chunkiest baby. Welcome to Still a Part of Us, a place where moms and dads share the story of their child who was stillborn or who died in infancy. I'm Winter. And I'm Lee. We are grateful you joined us today. Please note that this is a story of loss and has triggers. Thanks to our lost parents who are willing to be vulnerable and share their children with us. If you're listening to this podcast, just know that on our YouTube channel, there are pictures and videos that are related to the stories that are being shared. Subscribe and share it with a friend that might need it and tell them to subscribe. Why? Because people need to know that even though our babies are no longer with us, they're still a part of us. Corshell, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast today. We are, and our channel today, we're so grateful that you are here and we're excited to hear about your little Brecklin, or I guess your little, <laughs> your your big little girl, right? <laughs> My baby cow. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome. <laughs> Thank you for being on today. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Now, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, and uh, what where are you guys located? And tell me what your family looks like that time that Brecklin was born. My name is Corshell. I am a life coach and the founder of Because of Brooklyn, which is a nonprofit that we run. And as far as what our family looked like back then, Mark and I were really new into our relationship. I brought a daughter from a previous relationship and it was just her. She was three at the time. And we were, Mark was ready to start a family of his own and I was ready to start a family with him. So it was just him and I and our little girl and just the three of us, we were ready to expand. That's awesome. And where in the United States do you guys live? Oh, yes. We are in Northern Utah. Okay. So in the Western United States, you're basically right around the corner from us. So right. you're yeah. not very far away from us. We are right up the street from you guys. Yep, so basically. yeah, Western United States. Yeah. Wonderful. And what do you guys like to do in your spare time? What are some hobbies that you like to do personally? And then as a family? I really love, well, I guess we all as a family really love to be in the water. Mm. So you can find us at the swimming pool. <laughs> At any given point, as long as the sun is shining, I enjoy reading. I really love to research different topics, just Mm. really any topics at all. And so I do lots of research and I love to be outside and hang out with my kids. And we really love to just do things as a family, go to the park, take walks, ride our little electric motorcycle around. You guys sound pretty active and that you guys like to do stuff together. That's fun. Yeah, we love, we really love doing stuff together. That is wonderful. And then as a little bit of context and background, tell me how long ago Brecklin was born at the time of this recording. Brecklin was born almost five years ago. Her angel anniversary is in one month. So it's almost been five years. Almost five years. So you've got a little bit of time between between that, uh, her birth and that, and the time that it rocked your world, I guess, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And so you guys were, you mentioned that you and Mark were wanting to start a family together. And so was that a, something planned? You guys had more like, let's, let's go for it. Let's just give it a try. Yeah. It was totally just planned. We- And partly in the hands of the universe or God, however that looks like for you. Um, But we just had faith that that whatever was meant to be was meant to be. And Mark wasn't sure if he could have children. Mm. And we we never really explored that. And I was like, well, let's let's just see what happens. And nine months later, we were pregnant. Well, I was pregnant. So, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) So, so no fertility issues. You just kind of like, let's see how it goes then. Yeah. Yeah. I was totally like, I had no problem getting pregnant with my first child. And Mm -hmm. so I was like, as far as I'm aware, 
I don't have any issues. So let's just see what happens. And then if it's been a while and we feel like we need to go to the doctor, then we'll go to the doctor and nope, we didn't have a hard time at all. Okay. Not that that's great. So no fertility issues per se. So that's great. <laughs> that's, that's always nice to not have to go through that hurdle too. So yeah. Uh, and how was the pregnancy? Were you guys, were you feeling good and were you guys excited? I felt really good. Mark was ecstatic, Mm -hmm. super excited. And the pregnancy went really well. You know, the aches and the pains that you feel Mm -hmm. with pregnancy. And, but I love, I, as a human being, I love being pregnant. I love growing a human inside of me. I love just feeling that human all the time. And really, I just love having somebody with me at all times like it's just <laughs> something is so comforting to just know that like I can put my hand on my belly and there is a baby in there at all times and I loved that I loved to wake her up and push on her and make her kick and roll around and she was probably really annoyed with it but <laughs> I really loved it I think that is such a cool way of putting it. I've never thought of that like oh I've got somebody just with me all the time and I was like oh yeah you you kind of do. It's nice. You really do. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And did you guys um go and to like doctor's appointments? How did those look? How was she looking throughout the pregnancy? Mark went with me to every single doctor appointment. Oh, wow. Never Great. missed one. He was excited. <laughs> he was very excited. And my doctor is amazing. He does an ultrasound every single time. Oh, uh-huh. And so we got to see her every time. She measured normal. Everything looked great. I mean, it was literally the perfect pregnancy, no issues. Never once did she scare us with anything. It was just, it was pure bliss the entire time. That is wonderful. And when you guys got around for the the anatomy scan, right, at 20 weeks, it sounds like you guys saw her fairly often, but to do the, like, checking what the gender was and everything, how did that scan go? And it went really well. No concerns. Um, I can't quite remember, but I think that we had a pretty easy time figuring out that she was a girl. Oh, really? Um, Oh, just during that scan. Okay. Yeah. Just during her scan, like she was very willing to let us know that she was a girl. (laughs) And we, I mean, we were really excited and our little girl, my little girl, but you know, Mark's stepdaughter, she was super excited to be a sister. She also came to every single appointment. Oh my goodness. It was like a family outing. We do everything as a family. We always have. So, oh. you know, all the doctor's appointments, we all just get in the car and go together. Yeah. I think <laughs> that's so, that's so cute. <laughs> I love it. I, it's so funny. Cause I'm just like, oh, you can't do that right now Cause it's like, right. because of COVID. And it just, I was like, oh, how nice would that be to just, yeah have all of that family nearby um, at your appointment. So that's, that's really cool. Yeah, definitely can't do that anymore. No, that, no, it's, a, it's I, a, a different. It's very different I'm sure now. It's kind of weird. Yeah. Oh wow. And okay, so let's talk a little bit a little a, a little bit more as the pregnancy progressed. Tell us what happened or when you got in when you started to um, go into labor or when you kind of found out things were not going in the right direction. We actually didn't know that things weren't going in the right direction until after I was already in labor. Oh. Um, but knowing what we know now and then looking back, um, it was really the hospital that failed us in their intake process. Oh. Um, but like I said, what's meant to be will always be. No matter what, we hold no blame against anybody or any specific place mm-hmm. at all. We just knew that it was God's plan that she was supposed to come here for a short time and then leave. Um, but just reflecting back, I went into, I was 39 weeks and I had thought that my water had broken. It was a Friday, but it wasn't like a gush or how most women describe it. And so I was like, we should probably just go get checked and see what happens. And so I went up on a Friday evening, they checked us, everything checked out well. And the test had come back that said your water is not broken. So they sent us home Friday. I slept Saturday. I woke up, had a horrible headache. I had a fever. I didn't feel good. Mm. And so I just laid on the couch and just vegged all day. And I was so uncomfortable. 
I just remember I was miserable, so miserable on Saturday. And I slept on the couch that night, woke up on Sunday and still same thing. I didn't want to move from the couch. I felt super miserable. You still had the Um, fever and everything? My fever had broken. Okay. Yeah. My fever was on and off. It would, it would break and then it would come back as a low grade fever and then it would break again and come back. And it was just like, so up and down and back and forth, but I wasn't contracting and I wasn't having, um, so when they sent me home, they were like, if you can feel a pad within one hour of liquid, then you need to come back. And I wasn't doing that. And I wasn't contracting. I just didn't feel good. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, it's probably just my body getting ready for labor. But by Sunday night, I couldn't break my fever and it was starting to get high. And I just, just didn't feel good. Just something didn't feel good. And I mean, mother's intuition when you know, you know. And so I was like, I just, even though I'm not contracting and I'm not feeling um, like having any Mm. excess liquid. Yeah. I need, I just need to go in and get checked. Yes. And let's just, let's just go back up. If anything, we just come back home. It wouldn't be the first time we've gone to the hospital and come back home. Mm -hmm. And so we went up there and sure enough, I was in labor and that's when kind of the delivery, I don't know. Are you ready to go into the the birth? part of it. Yeah, let's do it. I was like, I don't want to like take any of your (laughs) questions away. Nope. You go for it. So on Sunday night, we went up to the hospital. Turns out I was in labor and I wanted to have a natural labor. And so part of their rules and regulations for natural labor is you can get up and walk throughout the hallway, but every 45 minutes you need to get back on the bed and we just need to monitor your baby, make sure baby's heart rate is good, make sure everything's okay with baby. I walked around and I had a doula Mm -hmm. as well. So it was Mark and my doula Mm -hmm. that was there. And we were, I had decided that I wanted to release my pain through walking around the hospital. And so we would walk for 45 minutes and I would grunt and groan and feel all the, the things that I was feeling. And then I would get up on the bed and we would check. And if everything was good, we would be able to go another 45 minutes. So we went two rounds of 45 minutes. And it was the second time that I got onto the bed that my nurse had a harder time finding her heart rate. And she was like, Oh, that's weird. Like I'm just having a little bit of a hard time. So let's just move you around this way and move the monitor over here. And so we, we tried to find it and we couldn't get a very good heart rate. So she called her superior in And she was able to get a heart rate, but it turned out that Brecklin was in distress. We Mm -hmm. couldn't figure out why. And we were thinking that it was probably because my body, like I wasn't relaxing enough. And so I was stressing her out. And that's kind of when everything went to flames per se. Mm -hmm. I just, the next thing I know, they're she's beeping people and all these people are running in and they're like get on all fours and let's see if we can get a better heart rate that way okay that's not working um and then they come in with um like the ppe for mark for the or and they were like we need an emergency c-section get the doctors here now and it was just all chaotic and the whole time like i'm just thinking what the heck is going on some, obviously something is wrong with her. And if it's just like a simple epidural then just give me the epidural and I just won't have an unmedicated birth, you know, ultimately I just want to make sure that she gets here safe. Mm -hmm. And we were kind of at like the furthest point from the hospital, from the OR. And so I always joke about this part, but I'm like, they're zipping me around like NASCAR. Like we're just zipping around the corners and just like, sliding around the corners. Like I was like, do you guys have seatbelts or something? <laughs> <laughs> Cause they need to get you there quickly. It sounds like. Yes. So. Yeah. They needed to get me there quick. I get to the OR and they give me an epidural. Mark does not do good with needles or whatever. And so I was like, please make sure that he stays 
far away from the needles because I really don't need him on the ground no. mm-hmm. at all. And so my sweet nurse, one of the sweet nurses, she held my hand while I got the epidural and they laid me down. And I remember the doctor like was pinching my skin, getting ready to give me a C-section. And the anesthesiologist was like, um, you need to wait a few more minutes. The epidural hasn't kicked in. And I vividly remember he did not like scream, but he very sternly said, I don't have time to wait for the epidural to kick in. I need to get this baby out now. And so unbeknownst to me, they decided to give me ketamine through my IV Mm -hmm. and they knocked me. Mark later said that they knocked me with like six vials of ketamine. And I don't know if you have ever experienced ketamine or if any of your listeners have experienced ketamine. It's the worst experience of my life. It knocks you out completely cold, but your brain can still process everything and hear everything, but you cannot react. You cannot move. You cannot feel anything. You cannot talk nothing, but you're still awake inside. It was, it was the worst. I wish it on, on nobody at all. So they knock me out with ketamine. They get her out. And the next thing I know, the doctor says, I'm sorry, your baby is dead. (gasps) And, and then Mark hits the floor, just bawling. And I'm, and I'm like still consciously awake. Like what is going on? What happened? Like somebody tell me, like, I need to know, you know, and on top of that, I am such like, I'm such a caretaker that I need to make sure that Mark's okay. Like he's crying. I need to comfort him. I need to find out what's wrong. And they had given me so much ketamine that I was out for. So she was born at 2 46 AM Monday morning on May 23rd, 2016. And I didn't wake up until like the ketamine didn't wear off until like 9 a.m. And even then I was still really, really, really groggy. Mm-hmm. And, but they were like, sweetheart, you've got to wake up enough to go see your baby. But between those nine hours, they had wheeled me back into my room. My doula had left. My mom and my sister had, had come up instead. Mark had made phone calls to his family. His family's out of state. And so they were on their way in conversations that probably wouldn't have happened if they knew that I was consciously awake, um, happened in my hospital room. You know, she's not doing well. She needs more blood or she needs more plasma. And I just remember Mark saying over and over, you need to do everything that you can to keep her alive until her mom sees her. So they did CPR for over 20 minutes before they were able to get a heartbeat back. And then they put her on life support. And essentially, you know, it was, it was breathing for her. She had blood transfusions, plasma transfusions. She kind of had, they did everything that they could until I was able to wake up enough and go see her. Oh, so you, um, oh, I didn't realize that that was, oh, this is like, I'm just thinking to myself how awful that would be to just know it's happening, but not be able to do anything about it. And, uh, yeah. So Mark is basically holding down the fort, even though he, I'm sure he's a wreck trying to make sure that Breckland is okay, at least until, so, um, he was told that she wasn't going to make it. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the doctor said, I'm sorry, your baby's dead. And then when they asked if they, if we wanted CPR, he said, yes, absolutely do CPR, do everything that you can. And then, you know, as the day progressed and she didn't progress at all. Mm -hmm. And, um, he, they said, you know, she's, she's not going to make it. We'll do everything we can to continue fighting, but essentially she just doesn't have, there's no hope. Nobody ever said that there's no hope. So let me, you know, make that clear. But there was, there was no hope Mm. for, for her at all. We knew that we just had to keep her. Mark knew that he had to keep her alive for me to meet her. And then we would make the decision together to, 
to pull her off of life support or to try to continue treatment and see if she makes any progress at all. Yeah. So around nine o'clock, you start coming out of the ketamine, ketamine yeah. um, being under with that. So, and, and when you start coming out, and I know that you mentioned that you were groggy, but what did they start telling you when you did start coming out of, out of the, the medication? I woke up and I was still really groggy. And I remember a new nurse was in there and Mark was in there on the couch and they kind of both looked at each other. Like, are you going to tell her who's going to tell her? And I just simply was like, I already know I heard everything. And I was like, I just want to go see Brecklin. And so they transferred me to my wheelchair and they wheeled me into the NICU where she was. And she was just around the corner and she was, you know, hooked up to all the monitors and life, you know, life support and had IVs and stuff. And every, I vividly remember every sixth breath that the machine would take for her, she would kind of seize. And it was the most horrible thing to see. I don't even like seeing babies like on IVs or, you know, anything at all, but to see all the tubes in her arms and on her legs and down her throat and stuff. And then to see her like have a, a small seizure every sixth breath, it was just, it was horrible. And I asked the doctor, thankfully he was there because I know that they aren't always readily there, but thankfully he was there. And I asked, is there any progress at all? Has she made any progress? Because if the answer would have been yes, I would have done everything that I could and I would have kept fighting, even if it was just the slightest progress, just a little bit more brain activity or a little bit more this or anything at all. I think I was looking to hold on to something. And he said, unfortunately, there hasn't been any progress whatsoever. And I confirmed it with him. No progress at all, not even the slightest prog- progress. And he said, unfortunately, I'm sorry, there hasn't been any progress. And I didn't even consult with Mark. I just, I think I got just really angry and sad at that time. And I was like, then take her off, take her off of, off of life support. I don't want it anymore. And I, I remember them saying, are you sure because when we take her off of life support, she will die. And I was like, yeah, I don't want to see this anymore. She's suffering. There's no progress. There's no point to keep her on life support and continue to give her blood transfusions and plasma transfusions and medications and stuff when, when it hasn't done anything. And I had had a very spiritual experience prior to that, while I was still under ketamine, that just kind of confirmed that I needed to let Brecklin go, mm-hmm. that she was not to have a physical body anymore. And so I think they were really surprised that I was just so readily and willing to just pull her off right away, even without spending so much time with her. But I just, I just knew, and I didn't want to see her hurt anymore. And I knew that by keeping her on life support, I was keeping her here for selfish reasons. And so we pulled her off of life support and she kind of started to do her like agonal breathing that any human does before they die. Kind of sounds like they're choking. Mm -hmm. And they warned me of that. And she did that. And they, you know, had the stethoscope on her heart and, but she didn't die right away it was, she started to coo and to caw and to make noises and she did it for long enough. Mark chose not to be in the room when they pulled her off life support. He didn't want to deal with that. He didn't want to witness that. Um, he didn't want to, to see her go, but she, she basically came to life, um, after we took her off of life support and to the point where I had my mom go get Mark and I was like, he needs, you know, he needs to see her. She's not dying right away. And then 
his dad happened to fly in and I was like, go get your dad. Well, the NICU has a rule that you can only have so many people. Yeah. So they decided to put us back in the, in the room with the nurse. She brought some meds and stuff. Cause I said, I don't want her in pain. So please let's keep her. If at any point she shows that she's showing pain, let's give her some more pain medi- medication. So they, um, sent us with the NICU nurse back to our room and all of Mark's family or most of Mark's family was able to come in or FaceTime with her. We were able to spend some time with her and she actually lived for two hours after being taken off of life support. And it was the most alive that she ever was. And it was such a blessing to us. And she did not, I'm not kidding when I say she did not stop cooing those entire two hours, those entire two hours. She just cooed the entire time. And then as irony and Murphy's law would have it, she ended up passing in Mark's arms. Oh, so she lived for about 10 hours or so. Yeah. She lived for 10 hours. And a good chunk of that was on life support. But then I just, I love that she was so that she was cooing like that. She was, I did too. And thankfully, like, I'm so glad I have it now, but somebody thought that it would be really cool to record Mm -hmm. her voice. And so I have that and I, oh, I love that so much. I love that somebody recorded her voice for me. Yeah. That is so special and so kind that somebody did that for you. Yeah. Um, So she passed away at, I'm assuming probably right around 11 o'clock in the morning or so. Is it about that time? It was at noon. So her official death time was at 1234. Mm, Okay. And uh, you had all of your family in your room, it sounded like, which is really awesome. Also, like just that's so nice. Did you guys get to spend some more time with her after she passed away? Yeah. Um, Thankfully, the nurses and the staff of the hospital where we delivered were so kind because I had never gone through it. I, honestly, I didn't even know that like this type of stuff happened. And so I was like, what do I, what do I do now? I mean, I never even had to plan a funeral before. And so I was just really confused and lost as to what I was supposed to do. And they said that we could spend as much time as we wanted to with her. They didn't have any of those, um, cuddle cots, Mm -hmm. but they warned us that, you know, about rigor mortis and all the things that happen after somebody passes away. And we chose to spend the day with her and the evening with her. And then I, it was about, gosh, 9 or 10 PM. Everybody had left. Mark was getting ready to go home. And we had, we had animals that he needed to take care of. And um, so we decided that it would be best for him to, to go home and sleep. And also, um, Cambria, my daughter, she, we decided that it would be best that she go stay with Mark and be at least with, with him. And the nurse took her, took Brecklin and put her in the cold room Mm -hmm. over throughout the night. And then when I woke up in the morning, so on May 24th, I asked for them to bring her back and before the mortuary came to get her. So we spent a good portion of the morning with her as well. And I don't think that the mortuary came until like two or 3 p.m. on May 24th. So we spent all of the morning and then some parts of the afternoon before the mortuary came. So we spent every, every minute we could as with her. As much as we could. That's great. Yeah. How are you guys feeling? I, so I just, I, I keep thinking like you guys are going along just fine. And then you go into the hospital and all of a sudden you're having an emergency C-section and, and then you're told that your baby has died and, and then your baby was revived. And and then just 10 hours later, I'm just, how are you feeling at this time? Like after she passed away, like I'm, I, I know you mentioned you had a spiritual experience 
while under um, the medication. But I'm wondering, how did you feel, though, after, after she passed away? I mean, I was heartbroken. I think anybody would be. And I was deeply, deeply devastated. I'm also the type that I always make sure that everybody else is taken care of. Mm -hmm. And so since we had so much family and, you know, everybody was hurting, I wanted to make sure that those people were okay as well. And so I kind of just put my emotions on the back burner, but that night after everybody had left me and I had sent Brecklin um, to the cold room, I was a wreck, like a complete wreck. I think I cried all night long and probably cried all morning as well until Mark got there and I put my emotions, you know, to the side in the back burner again, make sure everybody was taken care of it. Uh, and I was in shock too. Like, did this really happen? Is this really happening? And who do I even talk to now? Like, where, where do I go in life? What do I even do with life now? How do I, and then my daughter, who's only four, yeah. how do I explain that to her? And it was, it, yeah, I, it was a blur of emotions between just sadness and confusion and shock, and then worry about how I'm supposed to take care of my daughter and tell my daughter and take care of other people who are hurting as well. Yeah. Was your, uh, was Cambria able to, she came to the hospital. Is that right? She was able to meet Brecklin. So because of some things that, um, Cambria has experienced before this, we chose not to let her, um, hold Brecklin or see her. Um, we thought that it was best given her age and a little bit of what she had gone through. Yeah. It was best not to give her something tangible to hold or see. Oh, okay. And then take it away from her. Mm. We thought that that would be a lot harder. So Cambry did come up to the hospital, but it wasn't until um, Bre the mortuary had already taken Brecklin. I see. So she didn't. She didn't see her at all, and so we had to had to tell her at that point. And thankfully, nobody had told her. Yet they let me tell her um, that Brooklyn, you know, wouldn't be coming home. She had died and that kind of changed at the, at the viewing. We let her um, see her, we call it her bed um, instead of a casket. We call it Brooklyn's bed, but we got, we let Cambria see Brooklyn mm -hmm. um, after we had tucked her into her bed. Yeah. So the, mortuary um comes to pick up Brecklin and and then are you I'm assuming you are probably in the hospital for a couple more days because you just had an emergency c-section and those are not easy on the body at all it's a major surgery so are you in the hospital for a few more days then yeah so my family just stuck around the rest of the day um we end up having dinner together as a family. It was just kind of like we all just needed each other. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to talk about anything, but we all needed to be with each other at the time. So it was just really one big group of people that just stayed at the hospital until it was bedtime. And then everybody kind of went their own separate ways. And then when they woke up, they would come back to the hospital. So I was there throughout the 24th, all of the 24th. And then I was actually discharged on the 25th with some really strict instructions. Um, but you know, they knew that one, I didn't want to be there yeah. anymore. And two, I obviously had a funeral to <sighs> plan as well. So thankfully I was only there for until the 25th. So a couple, a couple days after. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Hopefully we're doing okay. Like after a recovery time, cause that is, that can be rough. So and so you go home. How does that look? Are you guys going to the funeral home and planning a <laughs> planning that funeral? Like how? What did you guys decide to do? And um, yeah, tell me a little bit more about that. So we had family that was um, that flew in from out of state, and they so they 
came over and, you know, they cooked dinner and did my laundry and did my dishes because when I was home, they wanted to make sure that I was sitting and recovering, but we did have appointments with the funeral home. And then um, it was Memorial Day weekend. So everything was closed. And so we kind of had to put things on hold and we did a little bit of planning and then Memorial Day weekend hit and everything closed. And then it was the next Tuesday where we, the city offices buildings opened again. So we were able to go pick a plot and finalize funeral arrangements and, you know, all of that, all of that stuff. But Mark's mom stayed in town the entire time. And she really, she was just like my caretaker the entire time. Mm -hmm. If I was home, I was home resting and and recovering from C-section. And she was, she was handling all of things. And thankfully my community as well brought dinners and asked if they needed anything. And so, yeah, we, we could focus on the funeral and the viewing and then where we wanted her buried and exactly what plot, which is something I never thought about. Like I never realized that I would have to choose a plot for some reason in my head. I just thought, oh, well, when you die, you're just assigned a plot. (laughs) Didn't realize that you get to pick one. Yeah. So (laughs) there's another decision that I was like, oh, I have to also choose exactly like where I want her. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of decisions where you're like, what? Wait, I didn't think this was going to be something in my, I would be doing this this early in my life. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and then because she was so fat, they were worried that she wasn't going to fit in a baby one. Oh. That we would have to buy a bigger casket. Uh-huh. So that was also like really fun because they're like, and then you can choose like what color do you want or do you want this? And I'm like, I I don't want any of this actually. So I was probably not the most pleasant person to deal with. Thankfully, Mark really stood up and was like the face of everything and the contact person of everything because I'm recovering from an emergency C-section. And on top of that, at this point, anger had set set in and anytime they were like, well, what do you want? And I'm like, well, I don't want this actually. I don't want to be doing any of this. I actually just want my baby. And they were like, oh, uh, help, help with the crazy lady, please. No, (laughs) no. You want your baby. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, crazy. You want your baby. Yeah. So thankfully Mark made most of the decisions, but he did, you know, we did communicate about it, but he dealt with most of the people that we had to deal with. Yeah. So you guys had a memorial service or a funeral. Will you tell me how that went? Yeah, we had a viewing at the mortuary and I honestly can't remember. Oh, it was a Friday. Yeah. So it was that following Friday. Mm -hmm. We had a viewing at the mortuary. And then the next morning, so on Saturday, on a Saturday, we had the viewing at the church that Mark and I go to. They so graciously held the, or I'm sorry, the funeral. They had the funeral there held at the church. And then we had a a brief little thing up at the cemetery. Mm um, uh, the leader of our church spoke and just said some brief words from the Bible. And then everybody got to go lay a flower who wanted to lay a flower. And it was just really, we did a balloon release and it was just really, a really beautiful, everything was just as beautiful as it could be. Yeah, that, that's good. I'm glad. Rochelle, tell me how you guys chose the name Brecklin. Well, Mark, for the longest time, probably since he was a child, there is, he's a huge fan of soccer, Mark is. Oh, uh uh-huh. And one of his favorite players is named Breck Shea. Uh Uh-huh. And so I had no choice whatsoever in our first child's name. (laughs) He told me that it was going to have something with Breck and so when we found out it was a girl I was like well 
How's that going to work? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what's going to happen? And we couldn't figure anything out. And then I was laying on the couch one day watching TV and all of a sudden it just came to me, Brecklin. And I was like, Hey, do you like this name? And he was like, yeah, actually I do like that name. And so that's where that name, the Breck the- part came from a soccer player and then we just added Lynn to so it. great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then her middle name is May and that's after my sister. Oh, wonderful. That's so yeah. cute. It's really a cute name. And I like the fact that it has, he's like, nope, it's got to have Breck in there. <laughs> yeah. There was no oh. choice. I had no choice whatsoever. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really, a, it's a cute name too. So it just has nice rhythm to it. I like it a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm wondering after Brecklin had been um, born and then after she passed away or, or uh, uh, during the time that you guys were in the hospital, what was the discussion about what happened to her? Like, was there, obviously she was in some distress and because of the labor, is that basically what they said? Um, or was there anything conclusive of like what sent her in that direction where she just was not doing well? That's what is so, so hard is we were told it was because um, she was in distress and that's kind of what we just lived with for a while, for six weeks actually, that she was just, it was just because she was in distress. And so that was really hard on me to know that, you know, I potentially caused this Um, but when I went to go see my doctor, cause I, I had a midwife and so that wasn't who did my C-section. And so I didn't get to see my midwife until my, my checkup at six weeks, Mm -hmm. um, for my, my incision. And so when I went, went back, you know, he asked how, how I was doing. And I, I asked him, I just want to confirm that this is why she died. And his face just kind of went pale. And I was like, what, like, what is it? What do you know that I don't know? And he was like, that's, that's not why she died. And I was like, well, what happened? Then tell me. And now I'm six weeks into this grieving and coping with things only to come to find out that I feel like you just told me my baby is dead all over again. Yeah. So, um, he said, it's, it's because of an infection called chorioamnioitis. Mm. It's actually a really common infection for women who are in labor for too long. But most of the time, the hospitals catch it and you're immediately given antibiotics. However, if it goes untreated for too long, it mm. can kill your baby. And he said, this is why. And it wasn't until I was obviously in in so much shock that I didn't bother to ask much questions. I just was bawling all over again. And it wasn't until maybe a few days later, I had told somebody about it and they were like, well, if it's because you were in labor for so long, does that mean that you were in labor on Friday when you originally went in and they had swabbed you and your test came back negative. And so I called my doctor and I said, please tell me the truth. And is, could I have been in labor on Friday? And he said, absolutely. I think you were in labor on Friday and I think your test was a false negative. He said, if we would have admitted you on Friday, she would probably still be here. So that's why I said earlier that it was really the intake, ultimately the test that failed and the, the hospital was actually prepared for a lawsuit. And I think maybe that's why some people weren't so truthful with us about what had happened because they knew that they were in the wrong and Mark, Mark and I don't live life like that. We just, we just wanted answers Mm -hmm. and you know, I, I am very close with the people that still work there. I love them dearly. And like I said, we don't blame anybody. We don't blame any place at all. What's meant to be will always be. And we've always just been faithful like that. 
Um, but it was really, really hard to hear that she could have possibly been here if that test would have come back positive. And since then, we did go to the hospital and say, we want change. If we didn't, we do not want Brecklin to have died in vain at all. We want change. Tell us what your intake process looks like. Tell us more about this test. And most hospitals do this test because it is cheaper and insurance is like that better. However, it's not always accurate, obviously. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen often, but there can be false negatives. And so we asked, is there another test that is out there or that needs to be designed? And they said, there is another test. It's more expensive, but it's got like a 99% accuracy. And we really like, we were like, this needs to change. If we can save one other baby, yeah, we, we want to do it. You need to change your intake process. That's all we want. Please change your intake process. And so that hospital changed their intake process. And then the other hospitals throughout Utah on the Wasatch front, they have also implemented this intake process as well. And it's very heartwarming to when a nurse reaches out to me and says, Brooklyn saved another life today because of the new way that they do intake more babies. They catch the water breaking Mm -hmm. that the other test wouldn't have caught. And those babies are alive today because of this new intake. Wow. That is amazing. I just, um, I was getting so, I was like, oh, this is terrible. Like how terrible to have this, I wouldn't say regret, but just like it could have been, she could have been here, but I just, uh, it does make me happy to think that others are being saved because of, because of, um, Brecklin. Yeah. And that's, that's all we wanted. We just wanted change. We just wanted, we don't ever want anybody else to experience this. And so if we can prevent that, we are going to prevent that. And we've been really, really blessed that the other hospitals have jumped on board and have also implemented this. Yeah, that's great. Corshell, thank you so much for sharing about Brecklin this um, and her story and her meaning too. Like I, I know we're going to get into that a little bit more later, but Thank you so much. Is there any one last thing that you'd like to tell us about um, Brecklin? Tell me um, anything about how big she was. I know you said you mentioned she was quite big, but if you want to tell us how big she was or um, how long she was and any last things that you want to tell us about Brecklin. Brecklin was just under 10 pounds. So when I say that she just had rolls for days, she had rolls <laughs> for days and she probably had rolls under her rolls. <laughs> And (laughs) I just, she's just beautiful. I know every parent says that about their baby, but she really was just the most, the most beautiful, beautiful human being and had the most beautiful physical body. And I know that she has the most beautiful spirit. Thank you again, Corshell. This was amazing. Thank you for having me.